Oh, we weren't last week. We didn't have class, uh, despite the rumor that we actually had class. But my lesson was so poor they didn't uh, broadcast it. So that was uh, that rumor is going around, and that's not true. Uh, although it probably could have been true, but it's it wasn't. Um, we're going to be in John chapter nine here in just a little bit. Uh, John chapter nine. You have to remember, I'm the I'm, re, I'm reminding you guys because you probably already know, but I'm the world's worst at, at remembering this kind of stuff. But John did not write in chapters and in verses, so we're going to be in John chapter nine, and we think, well, yeah, that's exactly what John wanted us to do. What John wanted us to do, he wanted this to be a Tuesday and Thursday university class so that would go on an hour and twenty five minutes, and so then we would have. Uh, get, still get a full three hours of credit, but we would um, just uh, have a take nine and ten at the same time because, uh, and I've taught, it's a lot, and we're not going to try that today, um, but nine and ten, ten just is an extension of nine, only it's just the color changes in some of your Bibles, it changes to red, so it really, it really does set up a big, a big um, kind of uh, revealing or a big type of uh, 10 is a wonderful chapter, but uh, it, it, but we're only going to be on nine. So, and Susan already last week, last two weeks ago, I went down a, a rabbit hole and I was talking about how the Bible got translated. And I talked about a guy, Emmaus from Holland. And I talked about a guy from Spain and I got in the car and she said, no one cares about that. And so I, so, <laughs> And I, I so uh, just I was kind of geeking out over that. And so I apologize for for geeking out over uh, the, how the Bible is translated and why Dave may not get back together with us in uh, John chapter the first uh, 12, 11 verses of John, uh, the eighth chapter and how that's probably may not be written by John and and how it happened to be in John. And and so anyway, I won't go back into it because I know nobody cares about it. It's been explained to me. All right. So uh, I, anybody ever had eye, eye problems, uh, had to wear a patch or a serious eye? We got, what? All these people, Mike, why, why did you have to wear, you want to, pi, not a, being a pirate. Oh, I was, I was, um, uh, we, we lived in, in near Philadelphia at the time and I, we were watching TV one night and all of a sudden my vision blurred and uh i was double visioned my my eyes crossed and so i had to wear a patch for several days and uh, finally went to the uh, you were an adult this is your married life you were when yeah you lived in, yeah uh, i was kind of probably 28 29 and it was it was kind of spooky and and hard to work because you had to choose your eye you know cover yeah. cover one and uh and driving became a little bit of an issue yeah but, uh, you lose you lose some per peripheral vision oh it, it i had a, a friend of mine who could only see out of one eye and he he loved that because if he ever got pulled over he said look i only see out of one <laughs> eye do you want me to watch the road or the speedometer so just <laughs> you know so was, that was his but it it, it as magically as it appeared, it went away. It went away. Okay, Jackie had one too. You had a lazy eye, and you had to wear a patch as a, as a so to make your lazy as a child or. Okay, who else? Somebody else had to wear Taylor. I don't. When was this? Must be, I think it was when you had your and he was an absent, All right. I scratched my cornea. Oh, you had a scratch. Okay, here. Just hand it to me. Uh, one summer we built a little trailer and I got a uh, flash burned from an arc welder and, uh, that was, it blisters your eyeball. And anyway, it only takes about three strikes and you're done. Uh, Feel it later. It doesn't happen right away. And then the other time, uh, I built model airplanes and when the, basically when crazy glue came out, I refused to wear protective lenses and you get glue in your eye and that messes you up. Yeah, that crazy glue. You need to be careful with that stuff. That is you, super glue, crazy glue. 
Uh, this is not part of the lesson. It will not be on the test, but I had some super glue and I got it on my hands and then I was trying to do a little quick project and instead of finding the proper things to clean off my hands, I, I was in the utility room and I saw a dryer sheet. And I said, I'll use that. Well, let me tell you what, dryer sheet reacts to crazy glue and it started burning my feet. That was ridiculous. Don't try that at home. Yeah, Dave. <laughs> When I was a teenager, I had a, a viral infection in my eye and had to, I, th I believe it was a patch, just yeah. to keep yeah. it covered, but it, that was not fun. No, no, it's not good. Your, your <clears throat> eyes, you do, they're just, there's something, they're very sensitive. You know, if you can remember back, you know, when you, if you've ever had, if you've got a good memory, because some of you, this is a long time ago, as a baby and you get your hair washed or you're washing a baby's hair or they're, and they get shampoo in their eyes and, oh, they just, what, they go berserk. I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. I mean, it's just so, so, you know, you don't want any of that. I know Mark, who's not here, a couple of years ago, he had some eye surgery and, you know, they said, oh, this is routine. We're going to, you just do this and it's, it's no big deal. And. Well, it'll be, don't worry. And, you know, 99.7% of all people who are at this surgery, they just open their eyes and everything's great. Well, he was in that 0.3% that doesn't work. And he, he was kind of worried. About a year ago this time, I have a good friend uh, up in Ogden that he, uh, he just was watching TV. And all of a sudden, one of his eyes, just like the light bulb went, it just quit working. And uh, so he had to have some surgery and and uh, stuff so our eyes are are pretty important to us today we're going to talk about in john chapter 9 there's a guy that is born blind and we know that because right off the first verse it's going to say that it goes as they went along he saw a man blind from birth so they see a man blind from birth and his disciples ask him they said rabbi who sinned this man or his parents that he is born blind um, right off the bat, that's probably poor theology that, uh, that there's anything that this person has done anything to be born blind as a baby or that his parents did something that caused him to be born blind. But anybody else have a problem with how this, how this chapter begins? They're walking down the road. They see a man born blind and the disciples, his followers say, Rabbi, who's what? Anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, what, Roger? Even today, uh, when there's tragedy, the, uh, there's assumption from people in general, uh, Sumatra, remember the, the earthquake and the, and the tsunami? Well, they must, they deserved it. Yeah. Well, this is kind of similar to what is going on in current uh, Judea right now, that either either his parents or he must have sinned because that's just the general understanding. Okay. That, anybody else have any problems with the disciples here? You guys need to sit closer together. Yeah. <laughs> You're, is, we're going to put you all on the same row here pretty soon. This is, this all right. is bad part. Mike has to get his exercise somehow. Um, I think we see in the disciples what we see around us every day. Um, I remember when Katrina hit Louisiana, everybody that I knew that was a churchgoer was like, well, God's punishing the wicked people. Okay. And it was, whether it was that or not, we tend to see through our natural eyes and rely so much on our natural vision that we don't see often God's how God's working and what what ways he's using to change people all right okay maybe but it's been a while since we've been back in class but the man this is a man that is born blind that is a beggar that they see and if you're one of the followers of Jesus why don't you say, why don't we change this guy's day? We can change his day, his whole life. We can give, Jesus, why don't you do, 
Instead of, they're not, they're not concerned. They don't show any concern for this man. They, can, they show concern for his condition on how he got there, but they don't show any concern for the man. They've done, even, they've done their own miracles too. The followers of Jesus, the apostles have done things. And so, but it's not like, hey, why don't we, Jesus, why don't you just change this whole guy's, change his outlook on life? Haha, <laughs> that's a little. So change his, Dave got it. Change it. Ah, oh, now everybody's starting to get it. Change his outlook on life. And we could, and it's just, they don't. They're more concerned with the, how, what, how to, who did something wrong? But that's very old test. That's very Old Testament. So uh, I, I don't know that you can really harangue them for not being, you know, positive because they weren't raised that way. Okay, Jim says it's very Old Testament. You know what I say it is? I think it's very human nature. We're more concerned with who did something wrong than trying to make the situation better a lot of times. I, Dave, I'm glad we're not trying to do chapter 10. All right. Dave, then Harry. I think at this point, the, the apostles were not yet 100% on board with the love aspect that Jesus is. That they didn't see that here's this guy that we've been following around and everything he does is because he loves people. Okay. All right. Harry? So uh, to Jim that says... It's very Old Testament. It's also very New Testament. In John chapter 5, he heals the man by the well. And the last thing he says to that man is stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Okay. So I think the disciples do have a little bit of context to say, what's the sin here? Because this man is struggling like Jesus warned the other man could happen. All right. Leanne? And then we're going to get into verse. We're going to get into verse three eventually. All right, go ahead. The thought that occurs to me is that even today, when we pin something on someone and say, "Well, it's because," you know, "Well, it's because of their lifestyle," or "It's because of this," or like Jim said, people were talking about, you know, wherever it is, it's because of their sin in their life that this has occurred to them. Then that frees me up from doing anything. Because I can just put the blame on that, them in that situation and, and, and Jesus and his love and how I'm supposed to respond to that. It, it kind of says, oh, you don't have to do anything. It's their fault. They can just go ahead and suffer. And that isn't how we're supposed to live. Jackie has something. <laughs> go ahead, Jack. I was going to say, where does it say in the Bible that being blind is a sin? Yeah, it, well, <clears throat> I don't think you're saying it's being that it's, that it's a sin, but his situation he is in is a result of sin, is what they're asking. And but so I don't think they're saying that it's a sin. I think they're saying who did sin and he's being punished because of his sin. But the one thing, and it's this is not for this lesson, but the one thing Jesus cares so very little about where you've been. One last. I don't wait. We just I'm going to get it turned. I actually every now and then say something. So he cares so very little about where you've been, and he cares so much that he gave his life about where we're going. And you know what? We are so concerned with where people have been, and do they deserve to be here? And I got news for you: none of us deserve to be here and if you think you deserve to be here then you've got then this is a great chapter for you because this is full of a lot of people who think they deserve to be there um all right go ahead to piggyback off what leanne said <clears throat> 20 oh my goodness almost 28 years ago i was involved in an incident that changed my life and at the time where i was going to church they announced to the entire congregation that I was a sinner and that's why I was in the situation I was in. Because, John chapter 9 is for you. And that and that they shouldn't even visit me because my sin might rub off on them or something. Okay. All right, we're going to go to verse 3. I think there's probably some more comments, but we're going to go all the way to verse 3. We've been here for 15 minutes, so and we started right on time. 
And Jesus responds to them, who was born blind? It says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And now, listen, if you're keeping track at home, verse 3 and verse 4, very interesting. And so he says, this is done so that the works of God might be displayed, especially if you're reading in the NIV. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. There's a word that in verse 3 and 4 occurs three times in verses 3 and 4. Starts with a W to save some time. Work. Work. It says, look. We might do the works of God. We must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. That's going to be important. John is playing a little game with us. Why is it going to be so important in John chapter 9? Because we're going to find out here in John, in the, I think it's the 14th verse, that this is the Sabbath that he's asking, this, he's doing this stuff. And so what are you not supposed to do on the Sabbath? And what is John in three and four? He's saying, we got to be about God's work. I got to be doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing. Night is coming and no one can work. So he's all about the work. And this is the day, it's the Sabbath when no one's going to work. And it's in verse five, and he says, which is the same thing he told us in chapter eight. He said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. If your eye, John is just having so much fun with this. I don't know whether John's sense of humor or the spirit's sense of humor, or they both are just cackling as they're writing this. I don't know. If your eyes are going to work, what do you need to have? Light. If you if we go into a completely dark room where there's no light source at all, what do your eyes do? They're of no value. And so here you're saying, oh yeah. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. By me, you can see. I am the light of the world. I am going to shine a light so that everyone can see. And this whole thing is about not being able to see. And so they're just, they're just having a great time. I've already said, and I'm, it's not just me. There are a lot of people who study the Bible and especially study the Gospels. And they think this is the most humorous chapter in the Bible. John chapter 9. There are some things that go on. It just it looks like the Three Stooges in a couple of parts. So, and if, if maybe you don't get that kind of humor, but I'm a lot into the yuck, yuck, yuck. So here we go. Verse six. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. All right, that that one verse, and and so we could be, we could stay in verse six. For the rest of the day, we're not going to, but we could stay in verse six for the rest of the day. And you say, that's impossible. It's not even read, but I guarantee you, we could figure out a way to do it. <sighs> so, but the first thing it is, he spit on the ground. If we go back to John chapter five, Harry already took us there. John chapter five, there's a man that's by the pool of Bethsaida and he want, he cannot walk. He's been lame for 38 years and he can't walk. And the reason he can't walk is we don't know, but the reason he can't get healed is because he can't get in the pool. Because when the pool bubbles up, you jump in and then whoever jumps in, they're golden. They're, they get healed. That's what they believed. And so, but he has nobody to get him in the pool. And what did Jesus do so that that man could walk? He rubbed his legs really hard on each side with a lot of friction. He got some of the water out of the pool and splashed on him. Or when the pool started bubbled, he helped. The, he told the guy, what? Rise, take up your mat, and walk. And pick up your bed and get out of here. And so, but now on this time... He has to make mud, so I guess, because blindness is a more difficult thing to heal than being lame. I don't think that's it. I, I mean, some people could have argued that in John chapter 5, which was again on the Sabbath, where Jesus gets in trouble for walking, some people could have argued for working. He could have argued that, well, Jesus didn't do any work. He just talked to the guy. It was the lame man that did the work. So now this time, Jesus is going to remove any confusion about who's doing work on this day. He spits on the ground, and he makes mud from his spit. Now, in case any of you for, or have forgotten or you weren't here, the Pharisees, they had a whole lot of a long list 
of things that you could do and you couldn't do on the Sabbath. And one of the things that, it, one of the most bizarre things that you couldn't do is if someone, if you had to sew on your robe and by accident you left a sewing needle in your robe and you walked around with that needle still in your robe, then you had violated the Sabbath because you were working, you were carrying a sewing needle stuck in your robe and you forgot about it. So, I mean, they got down to some very, very fine things. And so Jesus is sitting here and he spits on the ground and he makes mud. He makes a mud pie. Now, when we talked about eyes fall ago and about the things that having gone wrong with our eyes or taking care of our eyes, can you think, say, hey, I got a plan. Let's put mud in somebody's eye. Have you ever had a speck in your eye? You get the piece of, and then it's Pam's right now. She says, I got, now I talked about it. She said, I got something in my eye. I, I, when I was 15, I went on this crazy camping trip and I wound up a couple of days later and my eye was just so irritated and I, and I was not at home and I had to go to an infirmary at a faraway place and I didn't have my mom or my dad and, and I had a, a little piece, a little, what do you call it, a cinder, a little piece of, of, of wood that had popped out and had gotten to my eye and the skin had kind of grown, you couldn't wash it out and they had to, oh, I was very scared. I don't remember if I cried or not. Um, the, uh, but they got it out, and then I was fine. But when you get stuff in your eye, it's no, it's no fun. It's no good. And so this is the, here is the remedy for this blindness situation. Let's just make some mud and go and put it and rub it in this guy's eye because that always makes your eyes feel better. So he gets this, he makes this mud, he puts it in the man's eyes, and he says, "Go and wash in the pool of Siloam." which means sent. Now, the pool of Siloam, and at the risk of getting chastised by my wife in the car when we're on the way home, that nobody cares about these rabbit holes. So King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, um, he was going to be attacked by the Assyrians, and so he goes and he makes a tunnel. And this tunnel is about a third of a mile long. And it is not straight. It's very cur curvy, probably because it was falling a crack in the rock or... Maybe they didn't know that what they, but it was probably because it was falling a crack in a rock, let's say. But it's a third of a mile long. It's about, um, it's very deep. I think it's about 130 feet deep. And, but if you remember, here we are, Jerusalem, even though it's south on the map, then people would say we're going up to Jerusalem because it's high. It's on a mountain. It's on, and so then, but the pool is on, um, this tunnel comes on the west side of Jerusalem here, and it's about a third of a mile long. It comes down, and the and it brings water from the, the spring of Gihon to Jerusalem. So King Hezekiah knew that they were going to be attacked by the Assyrians. He builds this tunnel so they would get the water, and it meant the, the change in elevation. This is the thing that's marvelous and maybe even miraculous, a God thing. The thing is it's only... 12 inches change of elevation. I don't Everybody's like, go back to John chapter 9. The 12 inches is only this. So the change in elevation over a third of a mile cutting through rock that they had to maintain to get the water to flow into Jerusalem. And it, and it worked. And so they got water. And so this pool, and so it, since they... Visually, it looks like they're almost at the same level, but the water flows into Jerusalem to provide so that protected, they kept the Assyrians from having fresh water and provided fresh water for the people of Jerusalem. They, keep, they called it that the water was sent. <coughs> it was sent from the spring into Jerusalem because there's how could it get there? there but it, there's, a, there's 12 inches of change in elevation. And so they said, okay. I'm going to get chastised. I can see it already. All right, so go wash in the pool, which means sent. So the man, meant, the man went and he washed and he came home seeing. How long had the man been blind? His entire life. If you, ever, you, you know, you can geek out. Y'all know what I do. I, you, get on, you can get on YouTube and you can find these pictures of these little kids 
who have never been able to see before, and they put glasses, you know, they put these glasses on them. I've got a friend who lives in Texas. He's never been able to see colors before, and there's a special pair of glasses you can get. They're about $3,000, I think, or maybe it's more than that. And he was able to get some money and some help, and he got some glasses, and he can see color now. And he said, I walked out, and it was, I can't imagine you know, you live your whole life and a rainbow is black and white. Uh, uh, you go into a field of tulips that, and you're just looking, they're all just black. And, but now he can see color. What would that be like? Think about this man who's born blind for his entire life and he didn't ask to be healed. He doesn't say, we have no record of him saying, hey, Jesus, heal me. We, all we know is that these disciples don't care anything. They don't ask about healing him. They only want to know what's the cause of him getting here. And we remember John has no parables, and he has only eight miracles. And six of his miracles are unique to him. The two that aren't are both found in chapter 6. It's the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on the water. So when John brings in a miracle, here's the miracles for the other guys. They're all up into the 20s. When John brings in a miracle, he has a very specific purpose. And so he brings in this miracle about this blind man that he's there and he says he makes this mud and that's what he goes down and now he can see. And now his neighbors come up to him and the neighbors are all freaking out and they're saying, what are the neighbors saying? Verses 8, 9. They're saying, is that the guy that was born blind? And they said, no, that can't be him. And they said, isn't that the same man who used to sit and beg? And they said, no, it only looks like him. But he himself, he said, no, it's me. Guys, it's me. I am, I am the one. And then so what do they want to know? How were your eyes open? They asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed. And then I could see. And they said, where is this man? They asked him. If you think about it, he had never seen Jesus. He had never seen Jesus. When he met Jesus, he was blind. And he had never, Jesus sends him away. You need to go wash in the pool of Siloam. He's never seen Jesus. And he said, where is, I don't know. And so his, all of his good friends, these people that recognized him, they decided the best thing we had better do is bring this guy to the Pharisees. So they brought him to the Pharisees, who, who uh, the man who had been blind. If you think about in chapter 5 and again in chapter 6 and again in chapter 8, when Jesus is talking, there's a big interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. Here, there's no, all of this interaction, for the most part, the Pharisees and Jesus are not together. The Pharisees are talking to this man, the man that had been formerly blind, and Jesus is not there. So it's only the man that has been born blind. And so they brought him to the Pharisees. And now verse 14, like I said before, that the day that Jesus made this mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said, he put mud on my eyes and the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Um, and some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? And they were very divided. Have, have you ever, we don't, we've got a little bit of time. Have you ever been asked a ridiculous question? Have, a ridic I've never, I've never been pregnant. Um, but if you, but you know, you'd ask someone, Ask a lady that's eight months, three weeks, and six days pregnant. Say, are you ready to have that baby? Well, that's a pretty dumb question. I think nearly that your answer is going to be 99.99% of the time, yes, I was ready a month ago. Uh, anybody ever been asked a ridiculous question? What? what and give me an example of somebody who's been asking. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? I wasn't thinking. Or if I was thinking, I wouldn't have done that. Growing up the way I was raised, people would frequently ask me, what was it like growing up that way? I don't know what it was like to not grow up that way, yeah, so how do I compare it? Point. All right, Harry, do you have one? Anybody else a ridiculous question? 
Yeah, if, if I've spent a large, it's not quite the same today. I spent a large portion of my life. One of the most ridiculous questions that you could ask me is, would you like a hamburger? Because you don't need to ask that question because the answer is always yes, absolutely. So, but sometimes we can get a very ridiculous question. I told you that this is one of the most humorous chapters, I think, in the entire Bible. There's actually, you get to some of the Proverbs, there's actually some that are kind of funny, but you get into John chapter 9, verse 17. So the, the, here's the blind, the formerly blind man. He's, the Pharisees are there. They turn to the blind man, or the man who was blind, and what have you to say about him? It was your eyes, he's open. What is, what kind of question is that? What do you think? I mean, what is this blind man going to say? I don't like that guy. <laughs> or that guy is the worst guy I have ever met. Or I sure wish that guy would have left me alone. I had a good gig going. They asked him, saying, I think verse 17, it says, what do you say about him? And the man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe in verse 18 that he had been blind and received his sight. And so they come up with a plan. We need to get somebody else to come in here. And who do they go get? The parents. They go get the parents. They're, they're, these people are saying this man is born blind. Who's known him since the first day he was born? His mom. Let's get them in here. So here it is. And so uh, verse 19, they get the parents in. They said, is this your son? They ask. Is this the one you say was born blind? And how is it now that he can see? And verse 20, we know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age and he will speak for himself. They're like, here, we wash our hands and we wash our feet of this situation. No, that's another joke. So he said, we don't want, he said, we're not a part part of this whole thing and in verse 22 it explains his parents were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone uh, who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue Dave did you hear this it would be put out of the synagogue if they notified they was despised that is why his parents had said he is of age you ask him if anybody's going to get kicked out it's going to be him not us can you Mike can you walk this way? The, if you can think about, we pray, we have relationships, we have, all, we have a, the Bible, but the whole connection to God, to Yahweh, Jehovah, for the Jews is through who? It's through the synagogue, through the temple, and through the, the priests. And he's saying, you are now out. You are now, you're now out. You can't come back. And they're like, we cannot be separated from God. Okay. To me, the the <laughs> the elephant in the room is that only God can do these things on the Sabbath anyway. But that's just me. Okay. And so they they didn't like the answer that they got from the mom from the mom and dad. And so they bring back in the formerly blind man again. It's at verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind, and they said, all right, give glory to, the God, to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But I know one thing. I was blind, and now I see. One of the most powerful phrases, I think, in the New Testament. I was blind, and now I see. How many times have we walked into a situation, and we know we're trying to figure out where this person's been, and we're not too concerned about where they're going, and then something happens, and we realize that we were blind, and now I can see. Mike? Uh, and, and you'll recognize that phrase from, as a signature line from Amazing Grace. Okay. The, the, um, the thing that strikes me here is that, is that uh, the initial question was, who sinned? Well, 
now it's obvious that Jesus is the sinner. Yeah, yeah. So he gives this powerful answer. I don't know. You say he's a sinner. I said he was a prophet. You talked to my mom and dad. I know one thing. I know one thing. And I don't know how I'm going to get to heaven. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. But I know one thing. By the power of a risen Savior, I'm going to be there. Amen. And that's the only thing I need to know. A lot of this stuff I made, I would never know. And if I knew it, I'm not even half intelligent enough to understand a, a millionth of it. And he said, I don't know. I just know that I was blind, but now I see. And so they ask him again in verse 26, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answers them very honestly again, a very humorous verse. And he says, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples too? Don't you know that their hair had to go on fire? I mean, whoosh. He, says, he, he said, do you want to be his disciples too? And I mean, you can tell by their response. They hurled insults at him and they said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, but yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they, what, Dave? What did they do? They threw him out. They cast him out. Exactly what his parents didn't want to have happen to them, they cast him out. I don't know how it works. I didn't, they didn't have Facebook or Instagram or post offices or anything. But somehow, in uh, verse 36 or verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And what did Jesus do? He went and found him. There's no, you know, John gives us zero parables. But I think the example that we've got is a, it's a Luke 15 example. From what was lost, you start searching for it or looking for it. And it says, Jesus went and found him. And he asked the man, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy responds, who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus says, you have now what? You've seen him. You've seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped. He worshipped him. And the first chapter of John, I think it's John 1, I believe it's, it's either 14 or 19. I think it's 14. And John writes, this says that we have seen his glory. And it says, this man, he, Jesus says, you have seen him. This man who was had spent every day of his life blind up until today had seen the glory of the Messiah. Jesus says, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. You think about that. What does that mean? He says, let me see here. I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. So what does that mean? Who's he talking to? Mike. Uh, he, he's, he's saying you have, you have a choice here. If you truly want to see, you can see. If you think you see on your own and you're not willing to, to be corrected or to learn, then you'll be blind. It's, it's like if, if I think I'm strong in Christ, I, I will be strong. If I think I'm strong on my own, I am weak. Yeah. Paul writes in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, when I am weak, then I am strong. 
that it's through my in through my weakness that God has used me to give me strength. Okay, here. Oh, Dave. Throughout the Bible in the Old Testament, I believe King David said, if you'll blind those who are searching for me and make help me to see the way out, but blind them. And this is fulfillment of prophecy. He's saying, I came to open the eyes of the blind, but to put a veil of blindness over the people that think they know better. Okay. Harry, did you have something? Yeah. So like uh, Dave said, the Old Testament talks about a blindness that is natural, that you can't help. The, the chapter starts out with what sin caused this blindness, because that's the sin that they were assuming, uh, or the blindness that they were assuming. Um, Jesus is now delineating, there's a blindness where you can't see, and there's a blindness that you won't see. And the blindness that you won't see is the sinful blindness because it's put right out in front of you. You have to choose to ignore it. Okay. So who is, who is blind in this story? At the end of the story, who is blind? Okay. Where are we? Uh, we, I struggle. Maybe, maybe you guys don't struggle. Maybe you're all doing good. But sometimes I struggle so much about being so concerned with where people have been and not concerned enough about where they are going. Just like the disciples. Who did the sin? Well, the sin is in the... There is, Jesus, that this man, there is no sin. This man is blind so that we're going to see the glory of God through the work that's going to be done today. And so they sit down... They go through this thing, and at the end of the story, Jesus says, I came to open the eyes of those that can't see, and those that are think that are running around thinking they got perfect vision, I, they are blinded to what is really going on. And so what happens? Now there's some Pharisees on the scene that are interacting with Jesus, and some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this, heard him say this, and said, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus answered, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. Oh, you don't want to read that verse too many times. Now, if you were blind, you could get off the hook. But you can see that person that's left out. You can see that person that's hurting. You can see that person who's lacking direction. You can see that person who could use some encouragement. And if you were blind, you would be okay, Steve. But you actually see them. So that your guilt remains. Uh, that we don't we don't want to read that anymore. That's enough. Um, it's next week we will talk about John chapter ten, verse ten. My phone just went off because we went past ten ten. Um, but this it said that's what Jesus says. If you guys, if you just were blind, then it would be okay. But you saw this man. You see this situation. You know what you're doing. And your guilt remains. And so remember, we started out the day we said, John didn't write in chapters. And it's so nice. We get, this, we get this nice story. We can wrap up. We can make a flannel graph about this. We can have a, make some mud for the kids. We have, and we did chapter 9, and that's great. And then we can go into chapter 10. But, but John didn't write in chapters and verses. And that was, we, we fixed that later on. And so then it just right there, he said, if your guilt remains, and in verse one of chapter 10, and I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall into the sheepfold, sheepfold rather, and going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. He says, your guilt remains. And anybody who sneaks over and gets into the sheep pen must be a thief and a robber. You think their hair was on fire before? They're, now they're just completely exploding. 
because of what Jesus is going to say. We're, we're not having class next week. It's going to be Christmas Eve. We're going to have uh, no class for the next two weeks. And I don't know if how much many more weeks that we're going to, they're going to let us go through John here and what's planned after the first of the new year. But if there is opportunity to teach, we'll go back into John chapter 10. Great chapter, 10, 10. And it says the thief comes but to kill and to steal and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly or to the fullest. It's a very powerful chapter 10. We'll be there if we get a chance again. So we'll, uh, let's, we'll have a prayer, then we'll go right into uh, having some fellowship time. Father, we thank you so much for your gospels. We thank you so much, especially today as we look at John chapter 9. And Father, I just pray that you will open for each of us, you will open our eyes that we can see those that are around us. We see those that are in need. God, please use us to be your hands and feet. Uh, and God, help me to be more concerned with where people are going and less concerned with where they have been. In the name of Jesus, amen.